You know, we talk a lot about character transformation and a character going through an arc from beginning to end of a movie. But in today's film, wow, does our protagonist have one heck of a journey to go on. Howdy, I'm Jeff Goldsmith, and this is the Q&A. My agenda is simple. Each week, I plan to bring you in-depth insight into the creative process of storytelling. You know, I was really blown away by The Sound of Metal when I saw it at 2020's AFI Fest, and I was so grateful that AFI was doing their festival online this year. Everything worked really perfectly. There was even a good Q&A afterwards. Um, and it was a great way to, to bring people that love independent cinema, that experience of seeing a movie first and seeing it before you know anything about it. And, you know, for me at the, at the AFI Fest in 2020, that's where I saw Sound of Metal and I just loved it. And I was so impressed. And, you know, today's guest, co-writer, director, Darius Martyr, did such a fantastic job with the script that he's been living with for so long. And, and this is a really fascinating episode because he kind of takes us through the different processes and kind of the, the, the hell and high water he had to go through to get this movie made. And he was very forthcoming about his creative process, but also what was going on behind the scenes, you know, business-wise to make this happen. Obviously, Riz Ahmed's performance in this movie is just stellar. It's it's such a fantastic screenplay. It's really special, as is, you know, the one thing that we barely even touched on during this podcast that hopefully I'll have another chance to talk with Darius about, which, which was the sound design of this movie of a man going death was just extraordinary. I mean, it, it was... It's, it's a great all-around piece, and uh, Darius was very forthcoming with his answers, so I know you'll dig this episode. And speaking of things to dig, I hope you also check out Backstory Magazine over at Backstory.net. You can read us on a desktop or laptop or via our iPad app. You know, we even have an article in there uh, interviewing Darius about Sound of Metal, and um, it has some stuff that I didn't really get to in this podcast. So there's Interesting stuff still in our magazine article as well. You could read the entire screenplay um, through the magazine as well. So th there's a lot of great stuff in our new issue, issue 42. I hope you explore it over at our website, see our table of contents. And you know, you if you've never read us, you could test drive us. You could read our free issue. And if you decide you like us and want to subscribe, you could use coupon code SAVE5. That's SAVE and the number five, and that'll save you $5 off a one-year subscription. So, you know, running a film magazine during the pandemic is a bit silly, and uh, we would love your support. But now, without any further ado, let's jump right into our conversation with co-writer director Darius Martyr about his latest film, Sound of Metal. Okay, so here we are with Darius. How's it going, man? Good to see you. It's great. It's uh, I'm in New York in a room by myself. <laughs> that, you're living the life. You're living the life. Uh, yeah. well, look, I'm, I'm, I'm here in lovely Los Angeles, and I got to say, I saw your film at the AFI Fest, um, oh, which was just a fantastic way to connect people during the pandemic. And um, I really, I really loved it. And we just had you in Backstory Magazine, issue 42, you were interviewed for, for a really good piece on Sound of Metal. And I wanted to just go the extra distance to make sure that you were in the podcast as well. Um, I think the easiest place to start, because it's just great to give people a baseline, is your interest with writing. Like, how did you decide that writing was a path you wanted to pursue? Because not it takes some people, you know, half a lifetime to figure that out. Yeah. And I, in a way, it took me half a, it didn't take me half a lifetime to figure it out, but it, it really, for me, started in middle school, actually. Um, I, I, the authorship aspect of this is very important to me, and the writing part of it is really important to me. I came into a class, I had been in this very kind of, you know, local, small town public school up until sixth grade, but I came from a family that uh, of of kind of um, artists and really eccentric family from New York. So there was this real disconnect with the culture that of my family versus where I grew up. And, um, and you know, I, I could go into that, but I grew up on this goat farm and a spiritual community and all of this interesting really? stuff. Really? But my, yes, but my family uh, in New York, um, my aunts uh, and my dad's side, especially on, in one sense, a real like bona fide geniuses and and heavy duty kind of thinkers and um and my aunt is the head of neuroscience and my other aunt is a french literature analyst and all of this stuff and i i i had a very contentious relationship to school when i was young i wasn't i to put it politely i wasn't school material and but when i hit seventh grade this kind of ragged kid i 
um, came across this woman, Ruth Charney, who, who was teaching literature. And, and her, her class, in fact, was called the Literature Seminar. And so I stepped, now I had been in this very kind of rudimentary school system. And all of a sudden I stepped into this class and the, she had put me in this class as a seventh grader, even though it was mainly made up of eighth graders. And, you know, this was a, this was a new thing for me. I wasn't, I, I don't know why she put me in, but she saw something and she proceeded to kind of light up this part of me as a writer at that very young age. And However, it was more fraught than that because I was with in her class for two years. And then I went into this world, back into the world of school and public school, and again, fell right into that, um, the fringe kind of, I had no place there. And I didn't, I didn't write another word for the rest of high school. I, I, I had this, you know, it meant something to me. And I think that's why I didn't write because it meant something to me. And, and, you know, so fuck them. I was just not going to write. And, you know, it was, I was being a kid, but that, that kind of maintained. And then I found myself in my late teens, again, thinking about writing, wanting to write, but frankly, really stuck. And, and I also found myself very much on the kind of edge of what the hell is this? What am I doing? I didn't want to go to school. School. I didn't want to go to college. I didn't want to be babysat. I had an attitude and I, um, you know, I kind of found myself lost and cold and, you know, it was that kind of time of life. And I was really out there in, in the desert. I was unconscious at times. I was really, it was raw and hard and the edge of, of, of the earth kind of. And I got a call from Ruth and this was after I was, I was really in a tough spot. And I got a call from this woman who was my teacher. I hadn't talked to her in now five or six years since I was a student there. And she said, do you want to come teach? And um, I said, yes. And so I went and taught with her and then on my own a bit for four years. I went and taught seventh and eighth grade. Wait, so just, and, to, just to slow down for a second. First off, I absolutely love this story because it just shows the power of having one great teacher that could really inspire kids. And, you know, teachers are so important, getting the right teachers and the right interactions with kids, especially during the pandemic where teachers are working overtime. But when you say you went to teach, you didn't have a teaching degree, right? So you were like assistant teacher. Is that what you're saying? Well, it was a private school. Uh, it was a very, it's a very interesting private school called the Greenfield Center School. And it's modeled after a public school. So it lowers its, it tries to be available to everyone. Okay. Um, it, it models itself. Is that what I said? It models itself as after a public school. But it, so it's a very, it's a very unfancy private school, but there aren't those rules in a private school. I didn't need to have a degree. Okay. All I needed to have was the degree of Ruth. <laughs> so it was, okay. it was Ruth and her husband, Jay, who ran this program of middle school students. And it was really an exceptional program. And I went in as this, as this, I went in and taught for four years. And it was in that teaching of literature to children who were frankly not much younger than me. I mean, they were right. 13, 14. I was, I began when I was 18. Um, so I taught from 18 to 22 and, and that really unlocked for me a lot. That was the beginning of the answer to your question. Uh, that was the beginning of the unlocking of the writer, um, as an adult. And it was really the healing of teaching children, the healing of being with children that, that, and being a teacher myself and a nurturer that allowed for that. And frankly, that shows up in sound of metal. That's very much why he's around children. It's, gotcha. it's directly related to that time. That's good to know. And we're going to get to Sound of Metal in, in, in a few minutes here. But, you know, I would be remiss if I didn't start with this. You know, I, I, I have a screening series here in Los Angeles. And um, I, I show movies. We do Q&As in front of a live audience. I'm totally missing it during this pandemic because we haven't been able to do that. And I can't wait till we could return. But it's good that we're still able to do these Q&As online. Um, and I did a screening of Beyond the Pines with Derek oh. uh, when he was in Los Angeles and you co-wrote Beyond the Pines. And I'm curious what your biggest lesson was on Beyond the Pines as your first produced screenplay. And then we're going to go into Sound of Metal. And, well, sorry, we're going to go into your creative habit a little first. Well, this is great. This is fun. I mean, as far as the place Beyond the Pines, uh, there were a lot, there was a lot that I learned in that process. And number one, that was my first 
that was my first experience collaborating in that way. Uh, Derek and I had such a wonderful and f like highly charged experience. We hold up, we wrote some of it in Schenectady. We hold up in like a, a motel in Schenectady and wrote a bunch. And we, and we just, we really, Derek and I have a very specific relationship, which is that we, um, we really push each other. Uh, we really push boundaries and challenge each other. It's not polite. It's not self-congratulatory. It's really in service of being the best and most daring versions of ourself we can be. And that process really kind of opened up a, a creative collaboration potential that that was really exciting. Because I think that I think when you have, you know, we're both directors. We met as directors. We met first. Um, and so we both have that, that energy to us, which, which means there's not really a hierarchy in that relationship, which is great because we both just pound at each other and, and really go at it in service of this thing we care more about than our own egos, which is the film itself. And Place Beyond the Pines was so goddamn audacious. I mean, it breaks yes. all rules. It, it breaks the most fundamental of rules. So that was a bar that really interested me. And I love Derek for that. I think he's always doing that. And, but it was, it was something that was so fascinating. How is this going to work? How can we do this? How can we create this baton pass a la psycho that, that, you know, where you think you're in this movie and then you're in that movie. Right. And that which, was, which was so great. Yeah. It was so great. Like the audience was just floored when that happens in, in, in that film. So it, that right. was awesome. Uh, and, you know, we, we interviewed you in Backstory Magazine in issue 42. David Somerset did a really good piece with you. And um, it's interesting. One of the things that he mentioned that I just want to, I think is the right time to bring up here is that Derek around that time had asked you to edit some footage for a documentary that he was making that was like a documentary narrative hybrid, if I'm understanding it correct, called Metalhead, um, about a metal band called Jucifer and possibly the drummer is starting to lose his hearing. And the project, to my knowledge, hasn't been completed. Tell us how you started down the path that led to Sound of Metal, which I know was also interrupted by another script. Well, so... Metalhead is the very first thing that Derek and I discussed 13 years ago when we met. Um, we met at a school picnic for our kids. And so, and Metalhead- I, I is, love it. You're just the dads that got together to make films. This is, this is, are. This is awesome. Are. Uh, that's exactly what it is. We are, we had crossed paths a couple of years earlier at the IFP market when a film of mine was up for a grant and he was up for the Chrysler award or he just won it for, to make Blue Valentine. But- and then we, yeah, it was happenstance. We, we found ourselves at the school picnic. We immediately within, like we, we gravitated to each other. We started talking about what was exciting to us. We were talking about Metalhead and we were talking about hybrid. I was making a highly narrative doc at the time. And we just had this like great connection and it just didn't stop. Now Metalhead, what Metalhead, that movie, that seed is what, Sound of Metal is. It came from that. That was the seed of this movie. There was a handoff, another handoff that happened. And um it's and that par it's partially true and partially narrative, right? Like like it was a hybrid Metalhead, documentary. It, that's right. And when I first when I first met Derek, he was toying with the idea of the hybrid. And then over the next year or two, he started to engage in it. And again, this was just another wonderfully brave project of Derek's. So what happened was this there was a number of things happening. We were, there was Metalhead, there was my film Loot, there was Blue Valentine, and there was Place Beyond the Pines. All of these things coalescing at the same time. And at this time, you know, Metalhead, this poor lost creative child got kind of, you know, ignored. And in that time, uh, when, you know, Metal, uh, sound, uh, <laughs> um, Blue Valentine started to happen, I took the footage of Metalhead and I started cutting that footage because I was doing a lot of editing in those days. And so I started cutting the footage just on my own in my office and just started feeling into it. And Derek at one point said, look, I, 
I'm not going to make that movie. I can't make that movie. My life just changed. It's never going to happen. And I think that that's a very sad thing for anyone who loves a project, but knows they might not be able to see it through. There was also some, it was also like, there was a lot of questions as to how the hell you would make it, given the construct that Derek had begun with. And let me tell you, it was wonderful, really beautiful. I mean, Derek's such a good filmmaker. It, it was It was gorgeous. And it had this real palpable energy to it. And I, I said to Derek at the time, I, I had gotten obsessed with it. I had fallen in love with it, but I had fallen in love with something I found in it that I needed to create. So I said to Derek at the time, look, I'm, I, I, I'm not going to take over your project, but I will start it over. I just need to write it, you know? And so, you know, he agreed. And then I began the writing process, which was probably, I don't know, 12 years ago, 11 years ago. And, um, and, but that's how that happened. And, and, it, and it's really wonderful because writing and editing are the same thing. And man, if I could start every narrative process, a writing process, you know, with footage and be able to cut, how wonderful that would be. This was really great. It sounds like a cool process. I know that your brother Abraham has a co-writing credit. At what point did he come become involved in the process? He's technically a story by credit. Um, as Derek, does Derek, is, Derek is a story by credit. Yeah. But my brother is a writing credit, a co-writer. Oh, it is a full writing credit. Oh, yeah, yeah. Got it. Yeah. I wasn't sure about that. Okay. Yeah. So, so this is um, your brother's first screenplay then too, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so my brother Abraham's a musician and he's he's the guy, like Abraham and I would talk. We're always, I was always writing and he was always working on his music and and he has such a great story sense. So we would just take walks every day. We've always lived near each other in Brooklyn. And we would just take walks and talk about whatever we were working on. And this was just our how we operated. And um, about a year into writing or a year or two, I don't remember how long. Um, I say that flippantly like it's nothing. But at the time, it was, <laughs> it was a hike. I had, I had not solved this. I was working on it. But I had not gotten there. And um, my brother was in a really tough spot in his life. He had had a really life-changing physical situation happening with his back and he had been mugged and injured and it was all Sorry sorts of, he had lost like 50 pounds and he wasn't able to even pick up his instruments. It was a very, very hard time for him. Um, and I, I asked him if he wanted to come to the country with me, I was going to try to get away from my, my kids and, and everything for just a week to see if I could focus. And, you know, that was a rare thing for me. I didn't do that very often. I, I was, uh, you know, always around my family and I, I really just felt I needed to, to kind of focus on this project. So I said to, to Abe, why don't you come with me and bring your music and we'll just have meals together. And um, so it was again, a very natural process. We just went out to the country at this time when it was a real, like, it was a lifesaver, you know, we, he needed something. I needed something. It was a tough time in life and we made food and we found ourselves talking about this movie and it was such a rich conversation it was so it was so right you know he was lighting up aspects he was noticing things in me he was noticing places i might have been blocked um or not allowing that fullest remember i've had a a, a career you know it was hard for me to allow that voice as a writer, as I explained to you earlier. So, and he knew, he knows that he knows my journey. So he was unlocking things and he was bringing stuff himself as a musician. And, and this character of, of Ruben, it wasn't called Ruben then was, what was so, the name? what was the first name? You know, we went through a lot of names. Okay. Names are interesting. Um, I don't know what I might have been still using the name Edgar that was, related to the first to Derek's film. I don't right. recall okay. what it was, but I know it wasn't Ruben because we found that together. And, um, and yeah, it was just so great. You know, we were just connected and we just didn't stop. It was so, it was so obviously right that we just didn't stop. How long was that period when you got together and collaborated to get to your first draft? Well, we probably wrote like 1500 to 2000 pages to get to this draft, wow. not to the, not to the first draft, but to the final draft. And, um, and when I say wrote that, it's not like we ever had a, you know, that long of a script, right. but we wrote many, many different tributaries. We followed different directions. We, we wrote a lot on Lou actually on the character of Lou. I probably right, the girlfriend wrote, character in the movie. Yeah. 
I probably wrote more on on Lou than Ruben. Uh, fascinatingly enough, um, interesting. We're gonna I'm gonna bring that back up in the spoilers. But so the, you know, 1,500 pages. That sounds like possibly 11 to 12 drafts. If, if well, it's 11 to 12 drafts if you're starting each draft over completely right. and writing a completely different movie. A draft isn't usually that. Right. The number of drafts we wrote is embarrassing. I mean, okay. it's okay. so many. But no, the number of actual pages, the explorations of sound. We wrote all of Lou and Ruben's poetry and music. We wrote, wow. we, we, yeah, we really dove deep into these characters. And um, we wrote uh, all of Lou's journey going back, to, you know, we can talk about that later. We wrote, um, we really knew we were kind of engaging in something very special with this cinematic language, with this character, with this highly sensory experience. And we needed to follow, we needed to really follow those characters, start listening to those characters. And then something would happen, you'd have an understanding about those characters and everything would shift and you had to start over essentially. Like even for instance, The Addict, which wasn't always true. You know, we had to find that. Yeah, and we'll talk about that later for sure because I think it's really fascinating. But so just first draft, what would you say, it, how long was the period just first draft? And then of course, once you have a draft, you could reshape it which you clearly did for years, but how long to your first draft when you were just writing with your brother in the beginning? Well, I think that we had, uh, st after I started with my brother, I think we had like a bona fide draft in probably eight months. Okay. And so I want to talk about your creative habit for a second. You know, when you sit down to write, how important is outlining to your process? Obviously you just told us that you take a lot of notes and you really like to get into the world and create it for yourself so you could explore it. How important is outlining to your process and especially on Sound of Metal? It, it is important. I, I am, uh, I'm a real kind of structure holic. Like I, I think very kind of architecturally about structure and I need to, I need to, I don't write without a purpose. You know what I mean? I, I don't write completely. Uh, I usually need to know uh, why and what I'm heading towards. So I'm always thinking in terms of structure and I generally outline, but I will take, uh, I will I will take journeys sometimes because I think those tributaries are important to discovery. And I think that when you get too locked into structure, it's this strange dance with structure. But oftentimes I will write out uh, an entire structure um, and then and then work my way there. And then as I find inspiration, uh, I will I will play, you know, do you note card it or do you kind of do a treatment document? I've done both. I, okay. I, Derek and I note card because we've written other screenplays together. So we'll off, we put like a huge bulletin board with all the note cards. I tend to write it in paragraph form all the way through the script um, and just just write it even, even if I don't know the end, which I don't necessarily. I try to, um, I, I try to get some kind of architecture okay. there. Um, I, I tend to think in those terms more than my brother, Abraham is really detail focused. And so he'll, he would get really, really mired in detail and sound description and stuff while I would be kind of doing big picture work. And then we'd come together, we'd work the small stuff. And I'm, I'm very, um, I'm not afraid to throw out a whole draft if, if, if I, if I see it, you know, that, I, that's great. I, you know, one question about world building that you were talking about earlier, because a lot of writers, when they take notes like this, and we're going to talk about your research in a second, you, you could get lost in it. You know, you could have right. 20 notebooks deep and all these things. And some of your best ideas might be buried in the middle of it. How do you collate all that when, when you know yeah. that it's time to write? Because the more world building and research you do, the bigger stack you have to get through to really get that outline or to, or to really start pushing into the script. So I'm curious if, if that was a problem for you at all as well. Well, yeah, I don't do it in that order necessarily. I tend to write as I research because I, okay. because it's so inspiring. You know what I mean? That you'll have these ideas. So I don't compartmentalize like that. I don't say I'm going to research for a while and then I'm going to start writing. In this case, I started with the research of an existing doc, which is super interesting, you know? So I was already starting with a deaf community. I was already starting with a band. I was, right. and, and much of that informed the movie that we wrote, not the characters, but the construct. Um, so that, uh, that was really great. I mean, that was just research and it was there and it was stuff that you could really dive into. And then of course that, that 
uh, grew in many, many different directions, that research. Um, and sometimes I find that the research is about, you know, locking into those parts of yourself. Oftentimes you're mining those pieces of yourself that you find yourself researching, like, like, um, you know, those awe, those, those funny ineffable things that draw us to projects that you're not even aware of until you, until you get deep in it and you start realizing, Oh, this is, so I actually have to look at this, you know, I actually have to start kind of understanding those pieces of myself that I didn't know were in this initially, or, or I hadn't been willing to look at. That's interesting. And so basically, if I'm understanding correct, I just want to make sure I do, you're, you're concurrently researching as you're writing as well. So it sounds like your research really doesn't stop. And there was so much research no. to do here in the no. deaf community. So it didn't stop even while I was shooting. Yeah. It I didn't mean, stop even while after I was shooting. The, it was the, the authenticity of your film is just extraordinary. So I, I really appreciated the research that you did. You know, talk about writing itself. Do you try and get a page count done per day or do you have an amount of time that you set for yourself where it's going to be ass in seat and I'm going to only write for these amount of hours? Yeah, I don't try to accomplish page counts and I, and even ass in seats, I don't necessarily do because, um, it's my belief that writing happens in the weirdest ways. I think the engagement with it is critical. And sometimes that's an ass in a seat. Sometimes it's taking a walk around the block with a coffee. Sometimes it's cooking a meal. You know, often it's long conversations while walking. I'm a bit, I love the nomadic writing process. I love to, I love the adventure of it, especially when you're working with someone else where, you know, you can say, what's our destination today? Um, we can be in the office. Uh, I had an office in those years um, on Flatbush with a bunch of architects, which was hilarious because we were the only writers in the office. And it was this wonderful, funky space with a kitchen you could cook. But everyone was talking about like toilets and, you know, shit like we, 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 would, we, would, we would just be sitting there going, man, if I hear about another kind of tile, I'm going to freak out. But it, but it was actually great, you know, and, but we would often walk into Fort Greene, walk into neighboring uh, areas and get a different place and just, just excavate these kind of um, the characters and this impulses. And then when something would happen, we would sit in the seat and we would often write in parallel um, and, and, Abe would take something, I would take something, and we would both just lock in. And um, we, we, we must have looked really funny because we both have these kind of almost like I rock when I write, I rock back and forth. I've always rocked, you know, I need like that rhythm and my brother shakes his hands. So if you were looking at us, he'd be shaking his hands and I'd be rocking back and forth. <laughs> so, so you're sitting side by side. Do you just divvy up scenes or do you divvy up acts? Is that the way you like to go? Yeah, we like to trade. I, it, during most of it, we would trade. So it, he would, you know, it's fascinating. The, the character of Joe, for instance, I, I knew Joe. I, what, so we would often act out these scenes. We would, we, would, we would talk them and act them out. Oftentimes, my brother was Reuben, and sometimes I'd be Reuben. But my brother would rarely be Joe. Like, Joe was just kind of, I knew Joe. And, you know, so I would take Joe scenes and, um, and then I would, I would take the whole scene. I'd pass it to my brother who might've been working on a different scene. And then he'd look at that and then he'd breathe into it. And it was very, you know, always the same with Derek, just no ego in it. Like whatever, whatever lit that thing up, you know, he was always free to take a direction. There was never a concern about someone else's work or the preciousness of it. Work with a software where you can, you know, you can always recapture, you can always go back. So it's, it, there's not really an issue there. It's more just about having that freedom to follow impulse. I, I've asked this a million times. The answer is always different. When you have co-writers and you're, you're sending stuff back and forth, how do you track the master draft? Because, you know, yes, you could use track changes and you could see what each other has written, but how do you lock, do you lock it in a scene at a time and then put it in a separate folder? Or oh how do you God. keep track of what's the final version when you're going back and forth so much? It makes your head spin, doesn't it? Yeah. The, the, um, I've done it different ways. Uh, I do it differently with Derek than I ended up doing it with my brother. With Derek, we write in final draft. We do it. We, we trade back and forth. We usually have this 
you know, one draft, the mother draft that we end up kind of feeding everything into. Um, with my brother, I did some of that, but I also worked in writer duet that is more like a Google doc. And the, that, that's one document that two people can be working on concurrently. Um, and so there's never that, um, there was never, you know, in those days, Collaborate wasn't quite working on Final Draft yet. Right. And, and so, and I found that very, very helpful. It also has a time lapse feature so you can go back and see every single change and mark. So you could basically create a master script from any point. Yeah. And, you know, so that, that ended up being kind of our workflow on this script. Okay. That makes sense. You know, I, it's always something difficult for a writer to do to put a project aside for something else. But I know at a certain point, Empire of the Summer Moon took over and Sound of Metal was put aside. What yeah. was it like for you? Because it seems to me, especially like what I took from the, the Backstory Magazine article, was that getting away from it for a little while actually allowed you to return to it with fresh eyes and maybe see things that you hadn't seen before. Is that an accurate way to say it? It is. That was amazing. That was something I'll never forget because it, it, was a, it, was a, it was a real surprise to me. And it showed me something about myself. It showed me something about process. And so basically what had happened was, you know, we hit this moment with Sound of Metal where, you know, to be perfectly honest, I got rejected from the Sundance Labs maybe four times in a row. Wow. Um, with Sound of Metal or with other scripts? With, with Sound of Metal. Okay. Um, and I say it because I, I really want to say to other writers out there, uh, it's hard and there's no, you know, I have no, um, I think it's sometimes, I think writers don't talk about how hard and vulnerable the process is. And because of that, you kind of sometimes feel like, how the fuck is everyone else doing this? Because this sucks. <laughs> and it did suck. And, it, and, and there wasn't a lot of encouragement, I will say this, from anybody in the industry. I, didn't, I couldn't get anyone to support this project. And I, you know, that was the path. I, I don't necessarily say it with like any kind of anger toward Sundance Labs or anyone else. It just wasn't getting that. It just wasn't going to get that support. I don't know why. And um, and I really felt I could have used it in those years. You know, I was I was um, not being paid to write this. I had two uninsured children. I I you know there was not a, there was not an influx of money coming from anywhere. I was really trying to do this thing that that was pure, just made of pure faith, and. Um, and so I, I had hit this point with the script and, it, you know, after, had be, after having been rejected and kind of feeling like, oh, and I still hadn't really found it. Now, when I say that, I mean, found it, found it. I mean, I have a very high bar for myself. My brother does too. It wasn't like, I wasn't going to make this movie until I knew it was humming until I knew it was fulfilling its objective. I, wa I wasn't interested. I wasn't interested in making, uh, just making a movie. I wanted to make a movie. You know, I wanted to make a movie that really fulfilled something deep. And I just knew I hadn't hit that yet. It's not that I didn't have good drafts. I just hadn't hit it yet. And um, I actually, at this point, still had one more submission to Sundance, I think, still in line. But anyway, so I, um, Derek and I had been talking about Empire of the Summer Moon for quite a while and um, and really were excited about writing this project. And uh, and he ca he called me up one day and he says, hey, there's this thing came through. We can do this. And and I we and we were going to get paid. And now, you know, I didn't really get paid to write Place Beyond the Pines. This was, this would be the first time in my career that I had been paid. Really. Well, you didn't get paid at all on Place Beyond the Pines? Oh, I got paid a little. But, you know, hardly. Right. I, I didn't get paid to write. I wrote it all with no payment. And then it was it was retroactive. Yeah, that, yeah. Once it's sold. You know, it was kind of like a, it was just a, a thing that we did at the time. Yeah, yeah. We, um, 
but this was this was the first time I that I would get paid and here was the script and it was exciting and everything and I was looking at Sound of Metal and I said no. I said I can't do it. I have to keep writing Sound of Metal. Because it was like I'm so obsessed with it and you know I knew that for me I I wasn't really here to write. I I want to make a movie. I want to direct a movie. That was what all I wanted on earth was to make this movie. Even as much as I love Derek, as much as I love that project, it wasn't the thing I most wanted to do. Um and I was obsessed. And so I said no. And then I and then I'm like looking at my poor little children and my you know everything and I just thought, "Oh shit. What am I doing?" So I I changed my mind and um and and I wrote that draft. Derek went off to shoot Light Between Oceans, and I wrote this draft of of um, Empire of the Summer Moon, which was a dive and a half. I mean, 30, 40 books, and and like it's a huge piece of history. And oh my god! And I, that draft was two hundred fifty pages. Wow. It was just ridiculous. I mean, and um, but I remember finishing that draft, literally putting a period on the last sentence. And I cried and it was like such a, it was such, it was so much work to write that draft that I, I was just like, I literally had this exhalation of energy and, um, and I kind of looked up in that moment and I realized shit sound of metal, like all that time, you know, it's interesting when you shift your headspace, you stop dreaming about it. You stop obsessing about it. I had, I had been, I put my soul to this other, other project. And I look up and I think, oh my God, that, that movie, right. You know, after all those years. And it was so interesting, literally in that moment, I kind of re-engaged with that film. And I wrote the end of that movie, the last act just flowed. It just flowed. It was just like, it was like the gates just opened and it was, it was, so heartbreaking and so beautiful to feel that sense of flow after all of that struggle um, that you knew, you know, it was that thing where you just knew it was like, that's it. That is it. That's, that's from the deepest part of me. And that is right. And um, yeah, it was extraordinary. I'll never forget that experience. I, it was, you almost don't want to have that experience because it's so beautiful that you wish you could have it all the time, but you don't get it all. Well, the time. So when you went in to rewrite the ending of sound of metal, how long did it take? How, how long was that flow? Was it just a fast couple of weeks? Yeah. Okay. That's weeks, great. And, it, weeks, and we're going to three, weeks, three, four weeks, maybe I don't remember exactly. No, that's but great. Like, that's great. But it was like, it was, it was intensive. It was every day but it was just a flow state. And we're going to talk about that in a second because I want to get into the spoiler section. Last non-spoiler question is what was your budget and schedule when you were finally able to raise it for Sound of Metal? Well, I raised a budget and a schedule many times over. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, it bears mentioning that just like the uh, just like the writing of this, the budgeting of it and the making this was near impossible also and didn't, and, you know, so... Initially, I had a higher budget. I had um, it, I, this this process is so confounding to me. You know, I had other actors attached multiple times. I had other budgets. I had entirely different production teams. I had uh, I had those. I had I had productions that almost went that really almost went where I had people on the ground and we had found locations and everything. And um, the so money, many the money fell through at the last minute. Yeah, the, you know, financing, what I found with financiers is that, you know, what, well, what I found across the board, the inside baseball on this, and again, I say it to the other people making shit out there, because I just think it's really important that us artists yeah. and writers talk about this stuff, so we don't feel crazy. Um, the, uh, you know, what people do in this industry is they back pocket things. Um they back pocket projects that might look promising and they wait for them to be promising before they put any skin in the game. And they try to get involved in projects without actually putting up anything. What that means is, you know, I put up everything. 
I mean, so I literally had been flying around the world, meeting actors, always paying for my plane tickets, always paying for every meal, everything I was doing all those years. And, uh, and let me tell you, it was a lot of it. Um, and, you know, what would happen with financiers is they figure out a way to do this by leveraging everything so that you had a budget, but they weren't really putting up any money. I and mean, it's extraordinary to see the way this works. I realized at one point that I had personally put up more money than financiers were going to put up and they would own the whole movie. I was thinking, That's crazy. That's crazy. this is some fucked up shit. So we, you know, we ended up with a, um, I don't remember what the, you know, maybe it was three and a half, four million, something like that. Um, but w- this is an audacious movie to make at that price oh, point yeah. Yeah. because it's very, uh, it's very epic. And it also involved, you know, I was shooting on film. I basically did it in the hardest way humanly possible. I mean, shooting right. on film, shooting chronologically, um, and, uh, shooting live concerts, you know, nothing was safe, nothing was easy. And, um, and it really, and then the, but the other investment that was really, uh, important was the investment of time. So in the actor's process. So it was like investing, showing the actors, showing Riz, we're going to support you to put yourself to this movie for eight months, seven months before we shoot turn off the rest of the world, you know, that was part of that, you know, all of it. That's, that's one of the things. And then of course, what did we have- his agent think of that? I mean, cause, cause you know, you're turning down work when you're doing something like that. And, and this is a small film and I, I, his performance is astounding. The work he did was astounding. He learned American sign language. It's just, it's just great. But were there kind of roadblocks of getting somebody to commit like that? Well, there were roadblocks all the way, you know, I just couldn't get anyone to commit like that. That's why I couldn't make the movie, Um, you know, because no one would. And I wasn't going to make the movie unless someone committed like that. Got it. Okay. So, you know, and and that's my own craziness, but it's, that's really true. Now, Riz, uh, his agent was incredibly supportive, uh, actually. And um, I think that people knew the script was, was something. I think that they didn't know who I was as a director yet. Uh, how would they? It's your debut um, because all you have before is a documentary. I have a documentary, which which I could talk about in, in the crossover of experience. But beyond that, they knew something was cool in this script. Yeah. Uh, but they didn't know, no. But they, but they knew enough to say this could be something. Again, like this could be something. And now, meanwhile, I know who I am as a director. I had no doubt, but you know, convincing the world of that is a different thing. Ooh, hey, I'm jumping in really quick to remind you to check out Backstory Magazine. We just published issue 42. It's our latest issue, and there are so many cool things in it. You know, you could read Backstory on a desktop or laptop or via our iPad app. And, you know, if you've never read us before, you could test drive us by reading our free issue over at Backstory.net. You could find it right there or in our app, Backstory, on an iPad. And um, there's, there's tons of great stuff in our free issue. It should tell you whether or not you want to become a subscriber. If you do, and we hope you do, you could use discount coupon coupon code SAVE5. That's SAVE in the number five. That will save you $5 off a one-year subscription. Now, look, when it comes to some of the cool things that we do in the magazine, two things I just want to highlight that have been really fun to talk about for issue 42 is, you know, we, we have a section called Off the Shelf, where we publish entire screenplays by writers of note that are unproduced passion projects that they're waiting to get off the ground, you know, almost like today's episode, because Darius explained to us that he'd been working on this script for 10 years and no one would fund it. Like he had a lot of trouble finding funding. And in our latest issue, we have two kind of examples of that. We have Simon Kinberg, the writer of X-Men Days of Future Past and so many other things. And he has his first screenplay that he ever sold, he let us run. It's called The Ghouls of New York. It's a grave robbing uh, thriller kind of set in the 1890s, based on fact, by the way, of what was going on in, in New York. And, uh, you know, Simon takes us through what it what the script meant to him, what it was like selling his first script and really starting his career. And that's great. We also have Joe Carnahan in the issue with LA 58, 
which is his screenplay that he's been working on for a decade that he he wrote with his brother, Matthew Michael Carnahan. He's getting really close to making. I mean, we he gave us some storyboard and concept art uh, in, the, in the magazine in his interview, along with the entire screenplay. So there's really cool stuff to see in there. We obviously have great interviews with comic book writers, uh, you know, we have playwrights, we have screenwriters, TV showrunners. There's so many great things in Backstory Magazine for you to explore. I really hope you do. So thanks for considering becoming a subscriber. But now, without any further ado, let's get right back into our conversation with co-writer-director Darius Martyr about his latest film, Sound of Metal. What was your schedule? How many days? Yeah. Well, so, so I have a little story on that. We had not enough days and you know how this goes we had kept whittling this budget down and down and down we had financiers that hadn't really like signed on the dotted line going we we now we have 50 people on the ground we've got it took me four years to find the location for joe's house seriously it was like this is how much work had gone into this um we have deaf people coming we have all of this infrastructure and we still don't really have money in the bank from the financiers. And we're kind of like working out this. And all of a sudden the demands start getting different. And now they want my editing rights. Now they want uh, producer fees. Now they, and so my day count was going down, down, down. Found myself at 19 days. Oh my God. And and that was before I heard about editing rights. Now I'm an editor. Uh, nobody is taking those rights. Not anyone. And certainly not some fucking. Of course, yeah, we're, we're talking about Final Cut, obviously. So that's. Well, that. we're talking about Final Cut. Now, the interesting thing about Final Cut is that anybody you're working with, you, ha- you trust. Like I would have given Caviar, Bert and Sasha at Final Cut because I know that they wouldn't take it from me. You know what I mean? They, it wouldn't make sense for anybody to take a director's cut because then they don't have the support of the director. But those guys supported me. Um, I knew that. But it was the demand that concerned me. It was a lack of faith. Again, they were putting up less money than I had put up personally. These were very rich people that were putting up nothing. So how much do you really believe in a project? And if there's one thing that really irks me, it's that. It's like, here's Riz. You know, we talk about a process. Here's Riz. He's putting his whole career in my hands, right? He's going for it. That that means something. Olivia, the same. That means something. All of these people, these producers, everyone, they're putting their faith in me. And these motherfuckers wanted assurances, right? So I said, no, no, we're not doing it. I'm sorry. No, I can't make a good movie in 19 days. If these guys need producer fees, go somewhere else. I mean, Riz was doing it for nothing. I was doing it for nothing. Uh, Everyone was. They need, my producers didn't take fees. You want producer fees? Go make a goddamn Marvel movie. Goodbye. So here we are 12 days before shooting and there's no money. That's crazy. Um, We had $500 in the bank and Bert, my producer, was calling on favors for credit card room. Like that's what was happening. Now I didn't tell the cast. I didn't tell anyone. We were just like, I'm going to make this movie. And I started thinking, Jesus, how how are we going to do this? And I said, guys, I'm going to throw a Hail Mary out tonight. And uh, I had, I had a, um, I had met a couple in London that, a wonderful couple, Bill and Kathy Benz. And they had an, Kathy in particular was, had, had worked in film before. She, she's a really, she's a writer and she really connected with the script. And coincidentally, she knew my line producer, Chris Stinson, which we found it was a total coincidence. And she knew the script really well. I had been friends with them for years and I never occurred to me to see if they wanted to be involved it was funny because all those years, I think they were surprised that I never talked to them about it, but I didn't, I just didn't, didn't think that way, you know, just thought we'll go through normal, but I thought, okay, I didn't know what else to do. So I sent them an email and I said, I said, guys got some major red flags here. We're 12 days away from shooting. Um, I, uh, I said, 
I need you guys to finance this whole movie and I need to know. <laughs> That's an amazing email. Yes. And to their credit, they wrote back, well, let's have a conversation. So we had a conversation with them, with my producers, with uh, everyone, with line producer, went through the budget. We had a tight production schedule. We knew what we were doing. Um, and I said, uh, the guy said, Bill said, look, this makes sense on no planet. Um, and I'm going to talk to my financial advisors about it. You'll have an email in the morning. I'm going to give you that courtesy, you know, just to not say no right now, basically. Uh, so woke up in the morning, four in the morning, I didn't have an email, six in the morning, I'm in, we're in. And, um, and they wired the money that day with no contract. Wow. So that's, that's what we I call an say, angel investor. So, so basically they came up with the three or $4 million, right? The, right. the budget that you said. And right. And, and by the way, I'm not like my producers are probably going, Oh no, because I, I'll just preface everything by saying, look, there's tax credits. There's this, there's that there's yes, the, yes. there's the above the line, the below the line, blah, 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 blah. You got, but you yeah. got more than three to $4 million worth of materials. And I'm sure people work on deferred payments as well, but, but at the end of the Every day, how many days did you get for production? And then I really want to get into the spoilers section because we, we've got to talk about some of these story dynamics. How many days so, did the production so we ended up, end up being? We, we ended up with uh, about 25. Okay. Okay, great. That's great. Well, so look, podcast listeners, if for some reason you have not seen Sound of Metal, please press pause. Go to um, Amazon Prime, watch Sound of Metal, come back, finish this episode. I want to get into it. You were talking about this whole other Mar like Lou relationship that you were diving deeper into with Ruben. And, you know, there's a lot of tragedies in this movie. Obviously, the the hearing loss and the, the character arc for Ruben of learning to find a community that he could live in and make his peace with, with his hearing loss is one thing. But the loss of, of his girlfriend, uh, you know, Lou, is, is, a, is another loss in the movie. Tell, tell us some of the left turns. Tell us some of, just briefly, because I, I, I have a few other things I want to talk about, but tell us some of the left turns of Sound of Metal, of the other versions of the movie that could have been in your head. Well, yeah, there, there were a lot. But I, I'll, I'll tell you briefly. So my brother and I were really, really fascinated with the character of Lou because... Um, She's, she had to be of such veracity that the story would, really, she was the kind of compass of the story in a certain way. I mean, in the sense that Ruben, she was a one of a kind. She was very, very like uh, sensitive. She's a writer. She's an artist. She, she has dealt with a lot of pain. She's dealt with a lot of suffering in her life. Um, and She's the last person on earth that Ruben would ever want to harm in any way. And, the, and here's where the codependence begins, this, this concept of this codependent relationship where they're both keeping each other afloat in this way. But the truth of Lou had to be really, really distinct. And, and we, were, we were both really interested in this. So we wrote a lot of Lou's backstory, a lot of Lou, like her mother who had committed suicide was a... Um, was an actress and she had married this like com kind of uh, Gensborg like figure in, in France. That actually came later. That actually was sparked by a meeting I had with Charlotte Gensborg way back in like 2013. But these, these interesting um, kind of movements now, they, that sparked this whole backstory that then became uh, this really specific relationship with a daughter and a narcissistic parent and two narcissistic parents. And that's a dynamic that I'm really interested in because I think that, um, I think that, uh, sorry, I think that um, girls in particular are, are more sensitive than boys when they're younger. And I, I, and when I say that they're just developmentally ahead and they, they pick up things specifically from their mothers and, um, they, uh, they, you, they internalize them. And this is, I've done like an exhaustive non-scientific study of this through for personal reasons, but I'm really interested in this dynamic. And Lou is one of those people. Lou is one of these people that, um, that ha was internalizing all of this pain 
and didn't know where she started and her parents ended and her the the death of her mother was a real tragedy and it was the the kind of the kind of uh relationship where she might have gone with her you know she's like am i allowed to be here on earth that's lou and lou and that's why her eyebrows are 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 bleached you know she wants to disappear she's she's removing her sexuality She's removing her sensuality. And the only place she can be really overtly sensual or sexual is on the stage. But on the stage is almost an image of her dead mother. You know, so it's a bit of an... that's fascinating. Yeah. So, you know, it is fascinating for us. And we had written, like, the whole journey of her and her father and what it meant for her to go back. It was the place she most didn't want to go in the world. Right. To go back. And Ruben knows that, too. Um. You know, he says, he says in the story at some point, like, don't, don't, don't talk about going back with that guy, that guy. Well, that's her father, you know, but that's the last place on earth. Either of them want her to go. They both have a lot at stake in that moment of separation. There's, there's so many nuances, like even in the end, like one of the things that just comes through that's I'm sure left over from that is when they finally reunite, you know, she starts scratching at herself and he just gently takes her arm and stops her. And it's just that that kind of intimacy and familiarity just says so much without, you know, having a line of dialogue. Um, it, one of the difficulties of something like this is there's the the crisis of what Ruben is going through with losing his hearing. And it's inspiring for the audience to see him eventually overcome it. But, you know, this isn't a movie that really has a clear antagonist anywhere. It's the situation is the antagonist. You could say that Joe is a gatekeeper. Um, that stands in Ruben's way that Ruben needs to learn to work with. He's not by any means an enemy. I love the character of Joe um, who runs the home. Tell us just briefly, because then I want to get back to Ruben and your, your different endings. Tell us briefly about the, the creation of Joe and, and, and the community and especially the introduction of the rift between those who use cochlear implants um, which Ruben tries to get and makes him ostracized from the community and the 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 kind of grudge that's held for 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 people who've lost hearing that that get those implants. I know that's um, two questions at once. It's no, Joe no, and, okay. and, the, and the community. Well, it was also it was also the idea of an antagonist, and I would I would just say that you know one of the really important constructions in the writing of the story was that. It was this kind of red herring, which is this, which is to say, you think you understand the core problem in the story, which is deafness, um, and then you there's a there's a handoff where you actually realize the actual antagonist, the actual monster, is is Reuben. Reuben is the problem, right? The, the antihero, the the, addic- the addiction is the problem, not the deafness. So you know, like when you're in the diner. And with Ruben and Lou, that's not about deafness. It's not about that. Ruben's already saying, we can do this, we can do that, we can do this, we can do that. But Lou is seeing something else. Lou is seeing an addict. And Ruben's the sort of addict that if he uses, he's gone. That's it. Right. Gone. You know, he's been there. They know what that is. That's not, he's not probably going to survive it. So that there's a shift of awareness. And this is a really interesting construct. This is not, you know, and it's really it's really important in order to answer the other questions you were asking, which is because the, there, there's something that's at least interesting to me about this, which is that, you know, the audience is indoctrinated, a hearing audience is indoctrinated in a very kind of able-bodied perspective in this, which is that, yeah, just fix the hearing, get it done, get it done, get it done. And this is always there throughout the movie. Um, we might come to realize in watching this movie that we are kind of, a part of that system that wants to just think in terms of these, you know, that has this hubris to think we can just apply a fix to this, but the actual problem is internal. So when, when Ruben meets Joe, you know, Joe, Joe's been there. Joe's seen a hundred Rubens. Joe's has a foot in the hearing community, has a foot in the deaf community as a character. Um, The Paul who played him is from deaf culture. He's, you know, he, he speaks culturally deaf ASL, but, um, you know, Paul didn't speak English until he was, until he was five or six. Oh, that's um, interesting. Yeah. Th- you know, ASL is his first language. So he had to actually dumb down the ASL to speak like a person would speak if they were late deafened in their twenties or thirties. So, um, but he's seen it. He's been, he was an addict himself. 
And so Ruben is looking in the mirror a little bit. He's not going to be able to outwit the mirror, you know, he has to, you know, so there's a very quick, you know, kind of understanding between the two of them. Ruben's already been through programs, you know, right off the bat, it's, are you an addict? I'm an addict, right? And, but Ruben's like, but I just got to fix this shit and, and I got to go check on Lou. So there are his two things. It's like, fix it, check on Lou. Those are the two constructs that he has a hard time ridding himself from. And Joe is going to help him with that. So Joe says, you know, how long have you, uh, how long have you been sober? Four years. How long have you guys been together? Four years. It's very, very, Joe's smart. He quickly understands that addiction shows itself in myriad ways. There's a reason there's codependence anonymous. There's a reason that there's, you know, it's not just about the drug. And so this is getting to that scene about cochlear implants. Now, yes, Ruben went and got the fix, right? And Joe had told him it's not about this, it's about this. And that's true. But there's also a play on the word fix. You know, this idea of the fix right. is also this burgeoning addict in Ruben. And the, his behavior was addict's behavior. It's not so much that he got the implant. You know, that, that yes, Joe is making the point in that scene that there's a fragility to this community because this deaf community with a capital D is, it's very important that these, that the people within this community understand that this isn't a handicap, that this is in fact a culture, that this is, this is a way of life. And, but he's also speaking to the community of addicts who, who will get hurt. The ship will sink with Ruben's behavior. Now, Ruben's been sneaking out of off in and out of offices. He's been selling off shit. He's been indoctrinating Jen into that. I even had a subplot where Jen got in trouble, just didn't end up into the cut. So, it, you know, did you ever have Ruben turning back to drugs fully or was that never. just a version? Okay. So you didn't do ever. That. Okay. It wasn't interesting to me. Yeah. yeah. No, well, I, number, I'm glad you did. Well, number one, the reason is number one, it's, a, it's the end of the movie. You know, it's that's that's there's no recovering. I knew that truth about Ruben. It's not he's not he's not coming back from that. Right. And, but also it's it was always about holding that tension, you know, holding that tension. And that was really hard in the writing. It was really hard in the cutting. It's it's a very hard thing to balance that tension. Like when you feel that you feel like, Jesus, I don't know what this guy's going to do from scene to scene. That's what holds us there and allows for this very free language of. Uh, this almost documentary like feel because we still have that tension. We're still aware it exists, but the moment you dispel it, it becomes that normal addict drama that that's about something else at that point. It's not about that tension. And that tension is there until, uh, until the last scene. Well, and that's what's so interesting because every single part of his previous life that he was trying to hold on to disappears gradually over the film. And I thought the interesting the, the interesting thing about the ending was that going and seeing Lou was his last movement before he was completely free of the previous world. Did you ever have an ending possibility where they ended up together um, rather than this kind of bittersweet, we're in different places in our life ending? Because I, I love it the way it is. I'm just curious what the other endings that you toyed with were. I never had that ending with the current construct. I had it earlier. I didn't have that. Like I was never going to write that movie because it's not really interesting to me. Right, but right. The, but no. But their being together in the end, uh, in a version, if if when I, if I ever entertained it, which I did, um, was was also bittersweet. Um, it wasn't. Uh, it was just a different take, but, but that was such a different movie. So like when I had written that, there were so many different constructs at play. It wasn't in Paris. It wasn't, it was very different characters. Um, and cause like I said, we, we really wrote this in some different directions, but um, yeah, the, the idea of that severing of codependence of that, of that, of the pulling apart the fibers of those two people and seeing the individuals, both of them, was really important to me uh, on a really deeply personal level. I was kind of, you know, needed to explore that and and needed to explore the pain of what that is. And the, and like you said, the shedding, 
the shedding of identity, the shedding of possession. There's a, there's an almost biblical quality to that, you know. It's uh, and and I'm not a religious person, but I'm but it's it, it has a timeless literary quality of this this idea of of the shedding, um, and uh, it was very important, and it probably relates to my being raised Buddhist, honestly. Okay, I, I mean, look, I I think it's a great ending, and it, and it wasn't something that I expected. T- tell us about the title and the significance of Sound of Metal for you. Well, the title has a lot of significances. Uh, the it it's <clears throat> well, first of all, the movie is very much about the thing that you are chasing the whole movie, you know, that thing you are trying to reclaim and to get back. And like I was saying, their music together, their experience together on stage is less about a concert and more about a connection between two people. It's erotic. It involves uh, all sorts of different energy. And that's this thing, that sound, that frequency, that sound of metal that you're trying to recapture the whole movie. But you know, the frequencies of that concert are not dissimilar to the frequencies of the bell in the end of the movie, which is also a sound of metal. And that thing that you think you're looking for that ends up obliterating your head and ends up being that, like, the thing that you actually have to rid yourself of, that's reflected in, the, in, this, in this phrase, sound of metal. Sound of metal shows itself throughout the movie. The, the sound of metal is what connects him to that boy on the slide. And that is the exact midpoint of the movie where the, that, that actually is the thing that unleashes his willingness to, to allow for connection, to allow for human connection. So the idea being that this, this concept of metal is meant to indoctrinate you into your own ideas of what that means on a very literary level, um, metal music, right? But it's also the metal that he puts in his head when he gets an implant. That's the sound of metal. That whole third act is the sound of metal in his brain. Um, and I always uh, broke down this film into three acts, which were sound, it's the beginning, that he loses, um, of, which is the middle of the movie, and of means to be part of, to be part okay. of a group, and then metal. And the metal is the third act. And the metal, it, it, like I was saying, it, it relates to that thing that he thought he wanted the whole time. So it's all leading you to that place of letting go of that phrase, essentially. I mean, there's church bells that he can't hear at the end, which is, which is another metal that I thought was really fascinating as well. Like that, that kind of is going back with that thematic. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, you know, look, the sound design was brilliant. The, the concept of, of having so much, you know, subtitled true ASL going on was, was absolutely brilliant. There's, there's so many things more that I would love to talk about, but I know we're running out of time. Um, I guess, I guess two last questions. One would be what's a scene that you had to cut that there's a lesson in about editing because editing is the last stage of storytelling. I had a really, you know, there's a lot of scenes we cut. I mean, the first, the first, um, the first rough cut of the movie was three and a half, four hours. Um, the editing is a wonderful process and, and it's really, it really is writing. And we had a rule for ourselves, my editor, Mikkel, who is just tremendous. I mean, what a talent. And I, you know, I had, I, I would, like I said, I've done a lot of editing myself and I needed someone better than me by a long shot. And he, he was that guy. He's, he's extremely talented and, um, and his instinct is very strong to work on a really deep level. Uh, so we had a rule that you could never be smarter than Ruben. Um, that's sure, that, that keeps the audience in line with the protagonist, which means they discover things at the same time and they're never ahead of them. They're never ahead of them. And, uh, that's, that's very unusual in a movie. Usually we have this dramatic irony of being ahead of the character. We know the monsters around the corner, but the character doesn't know it. Um, you can never be ahead of Ruben. Um, but there's a, there's a very distinct construct in this, which is that, you're never ahead of Ruben, but after the midpoint of the movie, I just talked about that slide scene. After the midpoint, Ruben gets ahead of us. He starts making plans. He learns ASL. Now we're behind him, but you can never be ahead. 
Now, when I was in uh, Toronto, we we're premiering this movie. Um, I I saw it with a big audience. Uh, Mickle did too, and we both had this realization that we had missed a couple things. That we had actually had a couple moments where we were smarter than Ruben, and we realized together we had to go back. We had to go back to the cut. Interesting. And, and this was this was. I mean, we you know critically we did really well, et cetera. It wasn't about anything other than our our conviction that we had to make this better. Tell us and one of those scenes. What was an example? I'll tell you an example of the scene. So there's a scene where uh, Ruben, the, the first scene where Ruben and, and Lou sit and talk to Joe in the office. And Joe is saying, you know, you know, you can't, you can't both be here. It has to just be you. And then they, and then they, you cut back and they're, and they're kind of trying to sort it out. But in this cut, I had a moment where Lou talked to Joe alone and and Joe and Joe kind of looked at her and said, "Look, you know, surgeries, cochlear implants, surgery is it's, it's brain surgery. It's complicated, and uh, you got to pull the bandaid off quick here." Um, and Joe knew that that this was a dangerous situation, and um, we removed that scene because it it was a good scene. But what what happens? You can't. You got smarter than Ruben, and and when you get smarter than Ruben, it actually undermined Lou, because Lou, Lou needed to come to this herself. You know, she needed to see, and it's so much in, more interesting to watch the movie when you're seeing someone forming connections, rather than someone telling them something always, you know, and that's the way the whole movie's cut. But we just had these couple little moments. There's another little moment where Lou calls her father and you don't know it's her father. There's much you don't know about it. But again, it was a moment without Ruben where you were like ahead of him. He didn't know yet she had called and we did. And it, and it, and it actually took away from Lou, not, not only just Ruben, but Lou. And it took away from our, you know, building trust with an audience is a really is a real like there's a real practice in that and you know i get very frustrated in movies when that is undermined when i when i feel manipulated or i lose that trust with the language of cutting in a movie i i'm out i like i i'm not interested so i want that really rigid trust i want that to respect me and i want to be wanting to lean into the movie and the moment you start being told these things you kind of do this because it's like morgan freeman t telling you about the penguins you know right. um and uh, so those were, those were a couple moments that were really powerful to remove. They actually uh, made the film a lot stronger. And, you know, that last bit of cutting we did and removing some things was just wonderful because it exponentially just raised the vibration. That's, that's really cool. What was your toughest scene? What was the, the toughest scene as a writer and a director, the one you kept sweating, the one you kept coming back to over and over? And how did you creatively push through it? And it could be two different mm. scenes, one on the page and one, one as a director. Mm. I'll, I'll remind our, view, our, our viewers and our listeners um, that this is also your directorial debut and, you know, has some of the best performances of, a year, of the year. So that is quite a coup as well. Thank you. <laughs> well, I am really proud of those guys because they, they really earned it, man. They worked their asses off for it. Um, the, you know, the breakup scene, the scene in the parking lot, with between Ruben and Lou, uh, right before they kind of separate and Ruben goes to the community. That's a scene my brother and I wrote 50 million times because it was so hard. There's we're our, our greatest, that and the diner scene were really, really tricky scenes because there was so much happening that's not being said. And you, you don't, you know, the worst writing is this like expository writing where you're like figuring out a way to get information in there. And so it was so much about intention, about fragility, about danger that wasn't present. How do you feel the addict when he's not using all of that stuff? And that really took a lot of versions to get to the, where we were in that, in those scenes, they, we wrote the hell out of those scenes. And then, um, you know, the Joe and Ruben scene, like the goodbye scene there, that wasn't, that that one flowed. That was like a flow scene, you know? It was a flow scene in the writing and it was a flow scene in the shooting. It just was so there. Um, 
uh, the the end took a lot took a lot of work. You know that that last scene between Ruben and Lou. You know sometimes people mistake naturalism or simplicity as as something easy. I I find for myself that writing something simple is the hardest thing. Um, finding a simple path toward a truth is my greatest goal and the hardest thing. It's like you often have to work through those tendencies to over explain and ex exposition and really work your way to the heart of what it is. What is it, you know, and finding those simple, the simple gestures of the reach for a drink of water in the middle of a kiss. What is that? What does that mean? You know, finding those those little things are the things that that open everything up and that often for me means mining my own soul and finding the 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 thing that i that I, that i that's there but i'm afraid to look at you know so um yeah those things come to mind well look i absolutely love this movie you, you knocked it out of the park and you've been so generous with your time thank you so much darius and uh congrats on sound of metal i can't wait to see what you do next Oh, thanks so much, man. Really fun talking. And that's how the Q&A went down. Special thanks again to co-writer director Darius Martyr for being so generous with his time and coming down to talk about his latest film, Sound of Metal. If you haven't yet seen it, I really hope you do. It's got one of the best performances of the year. It's great writing, great directing, so many so many great things about this movie and you could see it on Amazon prime. So definitely make sure to check out sound of metal. And while you're looking for good things to do online, I hope you check out backstory magazine. You could read issue 42. That's our newest issue. There's so many cool things to explore in there. You could read us on a desktop or laptop or via our iPad app backstory, and you could find it all over at backstory.net. You could check out our table of contents. You could read the free issue if you've never read us before. So you could decide if you want to become a subscriber. And I hope you do. And uh, if you do want to become a subscriber, you could use coupon code SAVE5. That's SAVE and the number five, and that will save you $5 off a one-year subscription. So look, it would really mean a lot to me to have your support during this pandemic as, as podcast listeners and YouTube watchers. So thanks for considering. The Q&A with Jeff Goldsmith podcast is a copyright of Unlikely Films Incorporated in 2021. All rights reserved. And folks, if you want to get a hold of me, you can find me over on Twitter as Yo Goldsmith. You can find me on Instagram as Yo Goldsmith. You could email me, yogoldsmith at gmail.com. I will not respond immediately, but you still can. Um, you could also find me running the Backstory Magazine accounts on Twitter and Instagram. Same account. It's Backstory underscore mag mag so backstory underscore mag on twitter and instagram i have a facebook fan page i do not check it as often as i would like but I, i'll try and check it a little more but look i'm an easy guy to get a hold of and i'll try and get back to you as soon as i can i'm jeff goldsmith the publisher of backstory magazine and the host of the q a thanking you for tuning in and telling you to stay out of trouble till next week <laughs>